Today I'm going to go through the whole process of painting one painting from the very beginning to the end. And I usually start with an underpainting because it saves a lot of time and I use acrylic for that. So I'm just laying out my paints here, getting ready. I make sure I use a really large house brush because it stops me from fiddling. You just don't want to fiddle at this stage and it's all about just getting it on, slapping it on. I've already drawn my charcoal drawing underneath and I fixed it so that it doesn't come off. All I wanted was a very simple composition because I am doing this as a commission and the client is wanting me to replicate a small painting that I did many years ago so I don't need a lot of guidelines. So really just getting it on now using transparent colours, very important to make sure that the light comes through. I'm using a combination of Indian yellow, I think it was phthalo blue and when these two mix together they create the, the dominant green which is the colour that I'm after. I've also got some green as well going but mostly it's the phthalo blue. So the phthalo green now back into it just by using really big gestural strokes I can capture some energy in this underpainting stage. I don't waste any paint. I'm just cleaning my palette knife off on the painting <laughs> and just loading up again, splodging it. No need to be delicate at this stage. That's the last thing I want to do. Plenty of water and back into it again. I think that the uh, I think that might actually not be Indian yellow, but uh, more Australian red gold. All of the drips and everything, they're really great because I'm actually going to be wiping back in. Here I am picking out that little loose drawing that I did underneath of the man sitting in the boat with the dog. You can just see the drama. It's a fantastic stage of the painting. I really love this part. I could just paint like this all day and do nothing else. <laughs> and I know that a lot of painters just paint like this and they sell this painting, but I, I don't, I could. My paintings have a fairly high price tag and it's not, the client is actually looking for a completed and quite well finished painting so I'll be spending a little bit more time on it. I've recorded this all in sometimes up to eight speed and even more because it would be, it, the painting actually took me a couple of days to paint. So to save you time, I've chopped little tiny bits out and sped up all the rest. Otherwise you would fall asleep. Right, so just wiping back again. I use rags, they're just so much more absorbent and tough. I'm really keen not to overdo this, even though it looks like I've completely covered the canvas, I'm not blocking it in. You can see here, all this light that's coming through from the white of the canvas is extremely important to me to leave. You have to work wet in wet. This gives, this wiping out process allows you to get some gorgeous texture. Even if some of it gets painted over later on, it just gives you some guideposts in your composition. You really do feel like you're inventing the landscape and I am because I didn't start with any drawings of the background. I have a, a, a sort of a template in my mind for this painting. All I wanted was to make sure that the horizon that I put in, which is the edge of the water, was actually straight because even if a painting is sort of semi-abstract, if your horizon is crooked, it just looks off. You can be as abstract as you like, but if you do have a representation of something such as a horizon, make sure it's straight, measure it. I'm really getting rid of every little drop of paint, and even Best way to use it up is around the edges. Right, and 
I think now it's time to put it out in the sun to dry. And luckily in Perth that happens pretty quickly. Cleaning up now and getting ready for the next layer which is oil paint. I've got some leftover paint from a previous painting and I've just put it in alfoil. So I'm just getting and using all that up initially, just get rid of all that. I use a lot of paint in these kinds of paintings. It's not little dabber dabbers, as you'll see. It's quite generous and, you know, palette knife and so on. So liquid going on, plenty of that too. That's my main medium. I love liquid. It dries fast. It's stable. It allows you to create impasto. I'm just getting my mixes ready here. I'm mixing some colours together to get different shades so I can work really fast. So now that the acrylic's dry, I'm palette knifing on just to get moving and get some gorgeous, luscious, translucent depth into the upper part where the trees, the tree foliage is. It really is about putting on the paint to get past that tricky stage of how to begin. It's just jump in there and hence using a palette knife, I can really layer it on and not again get all bitty. The key is to stay loose and get the general tones in, which is what I'm up to here. And you can see that what I wiped out when the acrylic was dry has pretty much formed my trees in the background. I've got a big brush here. I only use the really big sizes at this point. Number 12s, 14s. I'm clearly just opening up a few spaces where I want to put some little blue spots. So the sky peeps through, which is kind of like a negative space thing. And I had some, I'm using Tasman blue because it's a really good direct blue that goes really well. That You can see why I wiped out the patches of green because the blue then wouldn't get tainted by the green underneath. So just controlling that and now just palette knifing on some nice thick colours, building it up. This is really pretty much a wet on wet painting so it's okay to just sort of work right into it all the way. I've changed the shades up a little bit to bring in a bit of white into that green. And here's a really good point where you can see by putting a darker, it is still a transparent green, but by going in with that darker next to the light, you really start to push forward your, your tree trunks. So it kind of develops as you go. No composition at all for all that stuff. I'm just putting in a bit of shading for the man and the dog and introducing a bit of pink and a bit of trans red oxide, I think. And sometimes I seem to put it on and then I wipe it off, but it, it's just an instinct thing and it balances out in the end. I don't think about those decisions a lot when I'm doing them. I guess after a long time painting for decades, it, they're just natural decisions. They're more like actions, <laughs> instinct. So it's a continuation of that process. Remembering that I've got a lot more work to do on the trees so they don't look so cut out. So now I'm bringing in into the 
into the bank of the river and I've moved over to some really dark pieces of tree to add some variation, lightening up some blues. It really is not an um, orderly process. It's just going through and working up the texture and the feeling of the painting. Occasionally I use my rag to wipe out something. As you can see, I go through a lot of liquid. It's um, a little bit hard to show you with the type of camera that I had because I was filming this by myself, but and there was light coming in from the side, but you can see how thick the paint is. I really am troweling it on, but you've got to be aware that even though you want to have that impasto effect, you don't want it to look like it's all the same. So you've got to keep moving your palette knife around and around if you want that more casual sort of look to, you know, a less contrived look to the texture. I've coming in now, putting some light patches as if you were looking through a bit of a forest. And again, that's opaque, so I have to be wary. I don't want to block out all my lovely light that's coming through from the white canvas and the transparent paint. I think just about every color I'm using on this painting, apart from the blue and the white, is transparent. I make the, the gold and yellow into opaque by just simply adding the white, of course creates a lovely pale goldy yellow and again here I I was just I had wiped out patches of green here so the paint goes in nice and clean I pretty much use a rag as much as I do a brush when I paint put a bit of that blue into the water while I'm at it and have a ponder and a coffee. <laughs> Always got them on hand. An important part here is to add some blue into the tree, into the trunk, some shadowy blue. So I've just used a bit of the sky colour, putting that into one side, imagining the light coming from a side. There I go with the liquid again, as you can see, so much. And take it down into the water. So you, I didn't point out that I wiped down into the water as well and as if the trees were reflecting exactly the same as they are above. Just getting that shadow, imagining the light coming from one side, which is always worth doing to create some dimension and form. As I said, so your trees don't just look like they're cutouts, they've actually got a rounded form. And just working across the painting, I've put in a little bit more goldy colour there. And when you look at gum trees, I love to focus on the white ghost gums, but they have all other colours in them. They have like uh, goldy sort of orangey stains and pale blues and mauves and here I'm just reinforcing those darks behind the trees and how it would appear in the water. And really enforcing those whites, yep. So just wiping those back a little bit if I think they're too extreme and trying to replicate the shapes in the water. Can you notice that I'm not getting stuck anywhere? I'm moving across the painting quite well, apart from fast forwarding at about 10 times speed, I'm moving quickly across the painting all over it to avoid getting bogged down. That's really key putting more palette knife dabs of colour 
and sorry about my head there. Right. Reinforcing the bends of the trees and what's going on behind them, but moving across the painting all the time. It's important not to drill down too much because this is where your painting's going to flip over from being a more expressionist type work where you're keeping yourself working to the mood of the painting and it could easily turn into something where you start really getting focused on minutia. Going into the water now and just putting in some of the colours that are in the landscape into the water. So I've got the same blue as it might be reflected. Usually it's not, it's not always an exact reflection of what is on the top. So I've, it's now a couple of days I've let the base painting dry a little bit and I've come back in and I'm going to reinforce everything, more liquid of course, <laughs> and into that sky again. Again, I'm, I don't want to blank it out, like just make it all just blank flat colour. I do want some a bit of the underpainting to shine through. It looks like I'm creating a lot of negative space at the moment, but I'll come back over that with the tree foliage. Okay, so I could easily just, you know, you could just say, well, why don't you just start with that? But you don't get the light and the color and the tone shining through. And if you just be patient with me, I'll show you what I mean. I've actually put a little bit more darker blue in the top, which is a little bit hard to see from here. Reinforcing the whites. And that is, they really come alive when you come on afterwards, once it's a little bit dry. Everything just is amplified. Mixing a bit of blue and a bit of, I think, trans red oxide there gives you gorgeous shadowy colours, keeping it loose and taking those shapes down into the water. As you can see, with the palette knife coming in now, it looks so random and crazy, but mostly because I sped it up really fast. The painting is coming along, progressing to my satisfaction at this stage. And I, that's really dark blue and dark. I think it's the Sienna that I'm putting in there just to get some more rough and random type marks and strokes. Again, still using a pretty large brush. I think that's a number eight. I use the Art Spectrum Definers they're really terrific, really good quality, a bit expensive, but they really last well. Make sure you wash them properly. So I'm continuing that process and imagining some of the shadows that might be coming down from the foliage, making sure I continue those colours and reflections in the water. And it's starting to look quite interesting. And now you'll see why I didn't bother putting branches anywhere because there was no need. All that would happen if you drew all the branches in is that you would drive yourself nuts trying to find them again. Not even worth it. Study your trees so you can just put them in yourself. Now I'm just reinforcing of course with the the greens and now you can see that it's it doesn't matter the edges are all refound through the foliage. And because the blue is still a little bit damp. Some of it mixes in with the green and it comes up great. So you can't really go wrong with this method. And here just using this, the blue that's already there and some of the green that's there and it creates a, a lower tone. So you're getting a nice soft tone of foliage that might be in the background. You're just utilizing everything that's already in action. It's not like going mixing another colour for that distant foliage. You're literally mixing it on the canvas. See the light colours that are forming? You're letting the blue, the sky, this is just like what nature does. The sky is mixing into the actual foliage, which is what you've painted on. And coming in now with some warm 
sorry that's cut off a little bit there coming in with some warm greens into the top where the sun might be hitting them I love this stage it's where you can really make things sing but just remember the rules that things underneath will be in shadow so they'll be darker lots of observing of nature and then when you hit the studio I didn't even look at photos yes this is not a realistic these are not realistic looking trees but I'm not even after that I just want the impression it works and then a little brush there one of the few times I pick it up where I'm grabbing some of the thick paint and dragging it around and creating little stems and things again just using what's on the canvas you're not setting out with an intention to draw something you're just utilizing what's already there same thing here with a little number I think it's a number four that I've got there not a really tiny tiny brush but it's got a bit of a point on it and just re reinforcing the distant foliage so it gives it some depth look at that see I'm just picking out those distant tree trunks by utilizing again what's on the canvas already so there's no need to go and mix other colors you're just bringing it all down it's a really organic way to paint I've never really examined it until I had to start videoing to get with it we get with the program and uh, I didn't analyze what I was doing I never used to talk about it I would just do it so since then now see I'm putting in some nice white highlights but since having to teach it and analyze it it's really quite fabulous I, I really love how it is so organic it's like recycling the paint that's already on the canvas see I'm just utilizing what's there and bringing it up and forward pushing it back so you never really lose or waste anything so there's always a period of time <laughs> where I just get to this moment where I just can't paint anymore and I call it the procrastination station and I think every single artist in the world knows it so here you can see all my gear clacking away lights which bleached out a little bit but where I'm painting is really bright so it was just trying to balance everything and I'm just moving along I think I'm actually this is footage from what I've already shown you but just from a distance so you can see my setup and I think that this is the, <laughs> this is where I get to that point there's my poor George underneath the table or Ruby George it's George I get everything out of the way and that's a dog toy and then I think what am I going to do what am I going to do and it's hot and this is generally what happens and it goes on for about an hour I'll make a phone call ring my friend <laughs> another artist and procrastinate together what are you doing nothing what are you doing uh, yeah that's typical that is absolutely typical go one way then go the other way undo it it just seems to work spinning on your spinny chair how many of you do that <laughs> it really really works but you've got to undo it you see otherwise it's no good it's something to do with aerodynamics eventually it's time to start for a short time anyway I think I went and had lunch after that okay so eventually one has to return to work and get down to the details I think that the procrastination is really important because it actually stops you from over painting and you're better off stopping and just waiting until that urge to keep going stops uh, and that preserves the rawness of the painting it's a really important moment so now I have to drill down of course and get a little detailed I am working from a previous painting that I had as I mentioned earlier a tiny little painting it was only about 12 inches by eight inches or less and I painted it decades ago and the client had a copy of it a print and they wanted me to do a larger version and of course it came out very a lot more comprehensive but it was just a little guideline that I had that's all that's all they wanted me to 
to replicate was this little very simple guy man in the boat with his dog and so it was giving me a little it's funny you know trying to paint something that you painted 25 years ago is quite bizarre because I was a quite a different personality I guess I was still me but you think differently and all the rest of it but the idea here was to try and keep and maintain the simpleness of that previous painting really to maintain it so I am working off the picture of the little man in the boat and he did come out a little bit different but the gesture is all the same so I am just really blocking him in getting the basic colors and the dog as well remember I had that tiny little drawing it was nothing much so simple and you can see here it's just really blocking in the colors and the tones just giving you a bit of a glimpse at my palette and what it's looking like at this stage a lot of those colors um, I didn't seem look like I was putting them on at the start that they've sort of evolved out of my foil packets so further just keeping on going with that more tone I just scrubbed in a bit of white and now I'm repositioning him with with some dark greens pushing him forward a little bit it's amazing how a slight change in something can change a posture really quickly just blocking in a bit of the boat into the background now you're going to have to forgive the wobbling canvas because I've fast forwarded this video it the canvas was a little bit sloppy in the stretcher bars which I fixed up later on but it, it just makes it look a bit vibratey so bear with me on that if it pulses while you're watching otherwise you'll have to sit here and I'll play it on ordinary speed you'll be here 10 hours later so I have a putting in the darks into into the boat with just some blues and transferred oxides they're my favorite colors for shadows and picking out the form of the boat you only need a couple of strokes and gestures to give the suggestion of it as you can see there and the depth it's the depth that we're after Just going in for the highlights keeping it simple as you can see I'm using I think that's a number 10 brush it's a big brush for a tiny area but you are better off using that because it stops you from getting all fine detailed and that's not what I was trying to do that would just totally take it off brief bringing a bit of ultramarine blue into the shadowy areas And, you know these brushes because they have um, a great edge those larger brushes I was just using you can use them for quite fine detail if you use them well just a bit of a small that's a number four West start brush you can see that I'm using there so it's not that small it's just it's just got a good point not that I'm using the point right now but if you throw them away when they get shaggy or use them for special effects but not they're not expensive so when those brushes lose their point put them in the crazy brush holder and get another one that probably cost you you know five dollars or something and then you've got your back to square one again when I use I'm using a cat's tongue there uh, so I think that's an imitation squirrel so it's actually like a little tiny filbert which they call a cat's tongue and it's beautiful but I need it for this particular job but sometimes if I find myself using a small brush and I I have to throw it out the door because I start getting too bitty but as you can see in this case that's pretty close that's pretty small but I am not I've switched over from the little pointed one to avoid becoming 
you know, too crazy. Again, this the headband, you can see that's the perfect using the flat of the brush. It's all, that's just one stroke. It does the job. See, now I'm getting a bit annoyed by using that small brush. I mean, I'm getting annoyed watching it because I'm doing this voiceover, it's, I just want to reach for the large brush. There's a lot of just blending in and chopping and changing and you see I just the color wasn't right going back in it is just building it up building it up and sometimes you know what I just wipe it all off and start again you've got to be prepared to do that that happens so many times during a painting and it doesn't matter you don't want to be doing that all day long but it really is okay Fixing up an error is sometimes takes far longer than just wiping it off and starting again. Just the little traditional dab in the eyes to make a little sparkle. So now I move on to the little dog, but the problem with this, I think I skipped some footage that didn't record. So you'll probably find that I fast forward on this and my Look at my bench, it's just a big mess. That is exactly how it is because I refuse to give up my old towels. <laughs> so I'd already done a little bit on this dog and I've missed the footage, so you'll just have to believe me. Here I'm just touching up the highlights. I want to just have him as a very simple little chap. This is very important to the client. You know, when you're doing commissions, it's very, very important that you take notes. You get them to write down, ask questions. And of course, you're going to do your artistic renditions and things. I'm not keen on commissions, but when they match up with what I love doing, it's okay. The commissions to watch out for, for me, are, I want you to paint my my grandma with her seven budgies and you know that can get really strange because it's very very detailed and those commissions take a lot longer to paint than your own creation because you know you're there's all these detail elements that people are looking for but my key point is listen to what clients ask for make notes of the colors that they or the specific if they're looking at a painting that you've painted a specific thing that stands out to them you know the gesture in the face of the animal or whatever that's what's going to matter in this case the client was saw something that I didn't even see in the painting and I didn't quite get it right and when we checked it over um, I had to get them to send me their print so I could actually see what it was they were talking about it was to do with the grin on the dog's mouth which I couldn't see. <laughs> so that was quite funny. We got it settled in the end, but it totally bamboozled me. So there's my little warning to you. Just make sure you do check in with them. So I'm just now going over everything. And for a loose painting, there's some areas that you tighten up. The rest of the painting is not tight, but it's just where it matters. That's all. So you tighten up certain details where the focal point is, which is exactly what I'm doing here. That beautiful cadmium yellow boat, which I'm now really enforcing. I really like the texture that was under it with the underpainting, so I'm a little bit wary of not wanting to go over that totally, but it so stands out, the yellow boat, in this composition. It's quite important that I get it looking like a feature. That's a little bit of a different camera angle, so you can see there's quite a bit of light reflecting, but you can actually see the texture of the canvas a lot better. I really love all that texture. That's where I'm painting over right now, and I didn't really want to go over it, but 
and I tried to find a compromise. I've slowed it down at the moment because I want you to be able to see, stop the canvas from vibrating and just for you to see the detail a little bit more precisely. Just putting some shadow, what I perceive is shadow there. And I've got to do his fingers as well, which is going to be a little bit of a process. Lending it back. It's probably a good idea to put your little uh, canvas tightening pegs in before you start painting. <laughs> I put them in afterwards, as you'll see towards the end, but this doesn't bother me when I'm actually painting. It's only just when you're trying to watch me paint on a wobbly canvas that there's an issue. <laughs> so just darkening it up down the bottom as the boat would be a little darker underneath. And now I guess I better finish off those hands. I don't want it to get too detailed. So I've just got to watch myself here because I'll start getting all perfect and go, oh, that doesn't bend like that, that shouldn't be like that. Because it's got to kind of make sense, even if it's a sort of a naive rendition. So I'm thinking about how the, the joints bend. This can end up a complete nightmare if you're not careful. I'm going to wipe down, even though I've painted it, I just, I just, I need a bit of light in there. So what's coming through now is the underpainting and it adds, by wiping it off, it's quite textured. It's a bit green, so I'll come back over that again in a minute. I'm going all out here. I'm looking at his nose and his face where I was able to leave him all white. You see, by putting that Australian red gold over it it's now got so much more light in it it was just a big dark mass before and now just tightening up trying to imagine a shadow there so that's going to take me down to my Nusha road you can see from this different angle the texture of the canvas and the paint it's not the best angle for you to view the painting but you do get a feeling of the texture. I did actually gesso this canvas a few times, I think three or four times. It was already primed, but I just gessoed it and it gave it a gorgeous. You can see the difference between the canvas texture showing through if it wasn't primed to what this looks like. Now with the palette knife oh, and, and just straight cadmium yellow, I'm able to get a very high voltage, high chroma area at the top there. I've mixed that cadmium, I think it's cadmium yellow light with a little bit of liquid to make it more stand, you know, more, more stand uppy, but you could actually just use it neat, but you would then have to wait quite a while for it to dry. And bang, straight into the water, as you'll see, I'm not trying to make it look exactly like the boat in the water because I'm imagining that the closer we get to that, it's the water is moving, so you're going to have that not exact shape unless the water was still. Because as the water runs or moves, it picks up, it's got texture, so it picks up reflections from different places as it moves. You know, it might pick up a bit of the sky and a bit of the bank because the water itself is turning different ways as it moves. So that's why it grabs different colors. So if it's moving, then I'm not going to have this crystal clear boat shape in the reflection. 
And as you can see, this is starting to get quite refined, just that boat area with the man in it, except not in the water, just rough. That's the key, it's not to be all perfect. Just really going in with some excellent dark contrast there, makes it pop out. For every time you do something, you have to come and undo something. So often that happens. You can see my palette getting very interesting. The painting is really starting to develop a lot of depth and color and texture. I don't seem to have a problem with knowing when these particular types of paintings are finished. They really do have an end point. And here, going in with the reflection of what is in the boat needs a little bit of thinking and not a lot of detail. So it's, again, trying to keep it very loose, the hint of it, the hint of the shapes, and you've got to think about it upside down. Just a dash for this and a dash for that. One of the great ways to do the water is to make sure it's all covered in liquid and then that helps. I'm, I'm, I'm just using um, you know, one of those sticks with the thingies on the end, I've forgotten what they're called now. And that is helping me to get up really close because everything's pretty wet right now. Touching up some of the whites, getting a little reflection up by the bank, some really light lights. Just one of those things, water, it's just observing and trying to be a little bit objective about what you're observing. So you look at something and you pay attention to what it is what, that you see, not what you think you see. So I'm signing off the painting. And now I'm going to give you a little close up of all the, the messy detail of what makes up a, an oil painting which has been done in a fairly expressive way with a lot of palette knife, big brushes. I'm really happy with it.
So a couple of weeks later, when everything was dry, I varnished the painting and I'm going to frame it. I made up a, a box frame for this. Oh, before I do that, I'm just signing the back of it, putting the title, the date, the year, where I painted it, my name, of course, for prosperity. And I'm now finally fixing up those loose, the sloppy canvas <laughs> by using some little corner, corner plugs to push it out. That came up really nicely. I wish I had done that earlier. It would have been a lot easier for you watching. So spreading out a nice big soft cloth on my huge work table, I've made up a frame already and it's a box frame. We do framing here. Not a lot of frame, we just do some basic framing. And I'm just popping that in and I have to do all the little things to space it out because it sits inside the frame. It's a really great frame, this one, silver on the front and black on the sides. It's very contemporary, seems to fit into everything, carefully turning it over so I can screw it in. It's all this process work. If you like this video, please subscribe so you can follow on for any more that are coming out. Or if you're on Instagram, follow me. So here I am just taping it all up, making it all nice so it presents well to the client, which is very important. Re-establishing re the hanger. There'll be stickers to go on, my own little branded stickers. All of this is so easy these days. There's so many products you can get online for that. You can order your stickers online. And then I've got to pack it up and ship it. It's going into state. I wrap it all up first around the edges to protect the, the silver leaf and cap it off and do it again. And then I get my bubble wrap out, which I buy it in the great big rolls. And wrap it up, there's a few little tricks in doing that to make sure the, padding, the bubble wrap is really nicely padded around the sides. Of course, I just thought I'd leave this bit on the end of this video because it's kind of like the, the final piece of the puzzle. Just reinforcing some of the bubble wrap just in a couple of areas around the edges and I put all the little brochures in that envelope which you can just see on the top. I've got pre-made boxes which I get made up locally and they are just so much, I have standard sizes. That's a very important thing to do as an artist, try and develop standard sizes and oh, they're so tough. <laughs> as you can see here it takes all of my muscles to bend them and get them into shape but they do, I've never had a painting get damaged. So I slide, slide those in with a bit of trouble as usual. Me and my own. It's so hard to do things on your own sometimes but where there's a will there's a way. And in it goes. Pack it all up and secure it so it doesn't get opened. Oh, yay. And then of course I've got my shipping company that I use so then I've got to go and make the labels. Oh first I better weigh it, measure it, and then I book it all in with my freight company and then off it goes to the client and everybody's happy. So don't forget to subscribe, hit the subscribe button for more videos like this or follow me on Instagram or sign up on my website.